really really happy with the kind of work and hard work and uh, siddharth thanks again i won't take much time it's already 10:31 i hope the session begins and all the best to everyone thank you again thank siddharth you. right so i hope all of us had a chance to go through what was discussed yesterday gone through the ppts and you know revised basically and we'll start with today's first session which would be the due diligence and the transactions so so if you could uh, take it on from here and we'll perfect so thank you so much so you know like yesterday what we did we did the basic and we did the theoretical part of it as to what is the law which is involved what are the legal things that we look at when it comes to share issuance share transfers what are the different types of things which are there when it's uh, when you look at you know from an mna perspective you know we have a share purchase agreement we have a business transfer agreement we have an asset purchase agreement so yesterday we were just you know getting to know what all is there the terminologies that we use reps and warranties indemnities uh, you know conditions precedent condition subsequent but now let's get on to the practical work of it so practically how is it that we do it and what is it that we do when it comes to a legal due diligence now like we said and you know so then outline of what we're going to discuss today is you know what is legal due diligence and why do we do it why is it important what is the utility of a legal due diligence report when it comes to a transaction so you know in a transaction with the investment bankers or the company the buyer the seller when a legal law firm or any lawyer issues a legal due diligence report what is the advantage of it what are the types of legal due diligence reports which are there and what is the different different scopes that are there as part of a legal due diligence report <clears throat> one aspect of a legal due diligence report is when you do a vendor due diligence report a vendor due diligence report is when you're doing it for the seller itself the company so it's no you're not doing it for a buyer or anybody the company itself tells you that you please come do your due diligence on us tell us where all we are lacking so that we can improve on it and tomorrow if an investor comes to invest in the company we can give them your report saying that this is what you people had found and this is what all we have done to improve on it then obviously you know so we'll just discuss how to prepare a, what is the scope of a legal due diligence report how do you prepare a legal due diligence report what all is that you have to look for in different different chapters because they're different areas right so there is a corporate chapter there will be a finance chapter there will be a regulatory permissions licenses chapter litigation chapter insurance chapter so different different legal chapters which are there in a due diligence report which you are expected to look at and you find issues in all those areas so we'll discuss what are the common things you need to look for and what are the common issues that you try and find in these reports then how do you frame the issues and how do you present the issues as part of a legal due diligence process and then the categorization of issues important mid level issue something which are not important say basic given the size of the deal something is a very small penalty say things like every establishment which is made or every office which is uh, made has to have a shops and establishment license but sometimes not having a shops and establishment license is not it's or not sometimes all the time because a shops and establishment the penalty for not having it in some states is as low as 100 rupees so from a transaction perspective yes you don't have a license but because the penalty is only 100 rupees you just make it a small recommendation that the company should get that license and it's not a red flag from a deal perspective so how do you categorize and material the materiality of different different issues how do you deal with that and again post submission once your dd report is done what is the importance of everything that you found in a due diligence report how is that utilized while drafting the transaction documents and how does it ultimately end up <clears throat> uh, you know impacting the transaction as a whole so let's start with the first thing what is due diligence and why do we do it so as you know you know this it's an age long principle of caveat emptor which is buyer beware so if you are buying the company i am telling you as a seller that this is what is this there i am giving you access to all my information please as a prudent buyer come look at all the information ask me whatever you want to and make an informed decision so i am willing to tell you everything that is there you can ask me whatever you want to and then based on that make an informed decision because the idea again is that one see from a seller perspective if today you are selling off your company right what do you want you don't want that once you you would want that once you get your money you also want your peace of mind you don't want that you know something there's a sword hanging at the back of your head that you know 
every, say tomorrow day after and sometime people will come and sue you for something or you know they find something after that and then they try and come and sue you or you know you don't want to be part of that mean litigations you want your money and you want it risk free so you would also want as a seller to give as much information as possible then obviously it's a level of judgment care prudence determination that an activity a person can reasonably be expected to do so you would want that you know as a buyer the expectation is that as any prudent person you know uh, will do uh, as a business with having a certain amount of business acumen what all things you would look for you would want the buyer to be make that decision as an informed decision then the process of evaluation of a prospective business decision by obtaining and reviewing the legal and commercial state of the business obviously from the buyer's perspective your idea is that the buyer wants to evaluate the business properly you want to get the right information you want to and it's not only the legal aspect of it it's obviously also the financial aspect of it because what happens is like we discussed yesterday when you are buying a company people will come and tell you all types of figures you go to startups and you know startups have come up with so much valuation figures for them there is such an inflated valuation that they will tell you that you know our sales will go 10 times in the next 5 years all out of air so you would actually want to look at the figures actual numbers the actual sales and then come and figure out what exactly should the valuation be and are the things matching the reality what is being shown on paper is it actually true what is there practically the objective and purpose is obviously getting to know the target its business validating assumptions so say today as as an investor i am planning to buy a company i keep on reading about it i've seen there's a lot of buzz in the market about it <clears throat> so you have a lot of assumptions that okay you know this is, this is a huge company they're doing great business etc etc maybe they have everything in place so you have those assumptions in your mind that you know but what, how do you validate those assumptions you will obviously have to look at the paperwork you'll have to look at what all documents are there in place and then you start validating those assumptions which are there and you get to know the business of the target as well we once were doing a transaction for and you know we were from the uh, buyer side and when we were doing the company we figured out so it was that company was into the sports uh, you know they were running a sports league a team in a sports league and so once we were doing that but we came to know that as part of it they also have a small business where they actually uh, have schools where they're teaching uh, basics to students now at that time it became an issue for us because from an fdi perspective in education sector there are certain limitations about how the money can be used so you know and even though we were not aware of it because it was a very small part of the business when we started doing the diligence we came to know that you know that this is the business which needs to be hived off to some other entity so that there is no uh, confusion as regard to fdi in it foreign direct investment because like we discussed yesterday foreign direct investment whenever you putting it in any company any sector you have to look at the foreign fdi policy to see whether or not that is a permitted sector or does that sector have 100% investment in it so all of these things become very important so and that is what you do you get to know the exact nature of the business what exactly is the business so like recently what happened was that we were doing a diligence on a company uh, which was in the food manufacturing business now food manufacturing as long as you're manufacturing food and selling it it's not an issue because then you can get 100% fdi in that company because you're manufacturing and selling retailing it but what we <clears throat> but if it's purely food retail which is there there are fdi restrictions on it when it comes to that now when we were doing the diligence of that company we figured out that while a lot of the um, food is manufactured by themselves they have contracts with certain third party manufacturers to uh, uh, you know actually uh, manufacture food on their behalf now contract manufacturing in itself is has recently been allowed as a 100% fdi sector so if you are doing contract manufacturing and then selling you can you are allowed to sell it and you are allowed to get fdi in it but the problem was that these people did not have any long term contracts any contract in written with those third party manufacturers now the law says that if we read the fdi policy it says that you should have a legally tenable contract with a contract manufacturer so this is just one of the issues that i'm saying that we came across right <clears throat> so now because we were doing a diligence we came to know that these people do not have any proper written contract with the third party manufacturers and in the absence of which there is no legally tenable contract and tomorrow the regulator can question whether or not that what you are doing is contract manufacturing or not or what 
the basic thing that you're doing is that you're just selling off food and just retailing those products instead of manufacturing and retailing. So that became an issue from an FDI perspective for us. So that is what happens that without doing the diligence, what we thought was that it's a huge company. It has these food plants. So and it's manufacturing and selling. We could not see that. That's what the assumption that we had. But once we started doing the diligence, once we started looking at the documents and things were not matching because they would tell us that their factory is uh, can produce, say, a thousand uh, tons of uh, whatever, a thousand kg of food and their output and what they were selling was 1500 kg of food. So, you know, the question came, where is the extra 500 coming from? Because that's in excess of your capacity. That's when they said that, oh, we have tie ups with third party manufacturers as well. So these are things when you start looking into it, digging into it, that these things crop up, they come up. And then as lawyers, this is what exactly we need to figure out and what are the loopholes and what are the problems which are there. Commercial prudence, buyer beware that we've discussed, risk management. <coughs> Obviously, the idea behind this entire exercise is risk management from both the buyer's perspective and the seller's perspective. Now, from the buyer's perspective, you are buying a company. Now I'm buying a company for an X amount of money, say 10 crores, 15 crores, 20 crores, 100 crores, whatever. So I am paying that amount of money for the business. I am buying it for the business that I am seeing. So I want to protect myself from any hidden liabilities or any hidden costs. It should not be the case that tomorrow I end up buying your company for say 50 crores. And I come to know that you have taken a loan worth 20 crores from some person and it's an unsecured loan that you've taken from that person. I was not aware of it. And now because I bought the company, I am liable to pay that money because the, obviously that's the money has been borrowed by the company. So tomorrow I should not be the case that when I end up buying that company, I end up inheriting all these hidden costs. So it is very important for me that we do a proper diligence. Now, obviously diligence in itself, like I said yesterday also, is the handicap of it is that to some extent I am dependent on the other person for, you know, uh, not misrepresenting facts and showing everything as it is, which if they don't do, then it's a case of fraud. Then I sue them for fraud. Then it's a no holds bar thing. But obviously the idea is that you ask the right questions. And if then they are misrepresenting or if they are lying, you at least have it on paper that they have, you know, given you false information. And tomorrow you can go to a court and sue them for fraud that you have a better case then rather than if you've not asked anything from them tomorrow, they can say that, you know, it's not like we were lying to you. You never asked it. So obviously there's a thin line of differentiation which comes up. But that's and from a risk management perspective, from a buyer's perspective, you would want that all these issues that you are identifying. <clears throat> now, I've identified a, a list of 10, 15 issues. We help them as lawyers categorize those issues as high, medium, low, depending on the materiality of the fact. Now, you know, something maybe so it's not all materiality that comes from the monetary aspects of it. Now, imagine that if say, obviously, like I said, there may be something, uh, a small uh, case, which is there. Let's say it's a food manufacturing business. Now they may have a lot of consumer cases against them, right? Now the man, the idea is that the overall exposure in those cases may not be much, but if the types of cases that everybody is doing is that there is some fault in the food or there's some food poisoning that is happening or something like that. So even if the monetary claim that they've made is not high, that becomes a red flag because then you actually point it out to your client saying that, you know, you're planning to buy this company. But what we've noticed is a trend in all these consumer cases that, you know, every year they keep on getting the same type of case against them. You know, that people are having some kind of food poisoning, which is a very common thing, which thread which we are seeing. So please, you know, get your people to check this out and whether or not there is some issue with what they're doing or what they're manufacturing. So obviously materiality depends on the situation. It depends on the transaction and depends on the nature of the business. If it is a, a criminal complaint against even one of the employees of the company, you know, and if it's of a serious nature, that also sometimes becomes a red flag because maybe that's a key employee. That's a key managerial person who's there. And uh, if they are a part of this fraud investigation or if they are a part of some, uh, you know, this and because of which we have to let them go, it may have hamper our ongoing productivity. So again, that becomes an issue. So you would want that all these risks are identified upfront. 
And as part of your risk management as a buyer, you would say that all these risks have to be borne by the seller because I have a cutoff date. I am buying this company as of 1st October 2021. So anything that happens post 1st October 2021, it is my responsibility. Fine, my company, I am the buyer. I've bought it now. But anything that has happened till 30th September 2021, that has to be the responsibility of the seller. And how we put all that responsibility on paper on the seller, have an indemnity regime. Because see, contractually fine, I bought the company. If something comes up, you can go to the court and sue them, go for damages, etc. That takes a lot of time. Okay. B, when you have to prove damages in the court of law, that is also, you know, there is a high standard which is there that you have to prove direct loss to you, you know, etc., etc. under the contract act, there are a lot of parameters. So you would want that there should be an indemnity clause in the agreement which sets out a proper indemnity process. And once that process is followed, and if you've breached any of these things, if I've specifically written that any loss that occurs to me because of any uh, case of food poisoning that is done against the company because of the products which have been sold until this state or manufactured until this state. Then tomorrow, if somebody comes with that case to me, I will genuinely just uh, claim my indemnity to you because you've already breached it. We've had a specific clause saying any loss that occurs to the company because of what you've done. So it's very important to have negotiate that. So that's why buyers want to do it. Similarly, sellers would also want to know what all can they be liable for, right? So it is equally important for them to know that, okay, fine, you've figured out these 10, 15 things. As a seller, I can push back on four or five things saying that, listen, this is not even material. And this is part of the risk of a business. You're running a business in India. There is a certain amount of risk that you will have to take. So please, you know, uh, it's a de minimis amount given the size of the transaction. So this is not on me. You figured that out. But yeah, these are 10 critical things. I can give you a specific indemnity for it. Or what buyers sometimes say is that, you know, what we can do is that, okay, we take the risk of this particular thing. We don't pass the risk to you, but we do a purchase price adjustment. So because you, I figured out that the potential liability for what you've done is around 10 crores. Or, you know, there is this case which we can lose and because of which we're going to spend this amount of money. We do a purchase price adjustment. So instead of paying you 100 crores up front, I'll pay you 90 crores. And that 10 crores I'll just adjust from the purchase price because that's a liability that can come to me in the future. So that's how different ways you do it. Similarly, from a seller's perspective, they want to limit their liability. So they would also, like I said, you they want that peace of mind. So they'll say that, okay, fine. You've bought the company on 1st October 2021. If any claim of this sort comes still for the next three years, then I'm liable to pay for it. Or because the idea is that if something has to come up, it will come up in the next three, four years. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And say, obviously, for tax laws, because the law says that you were, you have that seven year period. So fine for tax, I'm liable for the next seven years. But after that, that liability also stands still. So it's not like any point in life after 10, 20 years, you can come back and sue me for this. I've, so you want your limitation of liabilities to be contractually agreed. And like I said yesterday, also, you would want the sellers to the sellers would want that their liability, maximum liability is capped at the purchase price. So if you have paid me an X amount of money, my liability to repay you should not exceed that X amount of money. The only exception that we make to that rule is gen typically in transactions is obviously in case of a fraud when it's a fraud uh fraud you know so you've misrepresented something or you've done a fraud then it's no holds bar then we come to you without any limitation obviously so that is it and so you see the inputs on structuring like i said like we figured out that because they had a you know that company had a particular part of business which was not uh, within the fdi regime so we asked them to hype that business off. Similarly, you know, recently we were uh, doing it for a company and that company, their original business for which basically the business for which we were putting in money was that that company was in the e-commerce space. Now they were in the e-commerce space and they were doing it, selling products and, and then is an e-commerce marketplace. So the Indian laws, what they say is that an e-commerce marketplace where you're just providing a, a platform 
for buyers and sellers to come and buy products you know sellers can enlist themselves and buyers can come and buy from there so that is 100% fdi is allowed but inventory based model of e-commerce where you own the product and you're selling it yourself through a website that for that fdi is not allowed so now that company had a small part so they had a small business where they were selling some second hand products uh, they were buying second hand products and selling it to their vendors and the vendors could then uh, you know refurbish those products and then list them again on their website now even though it was a small part of what they were doing just to incentivize their vendors that was that fell into the category of inventory based e-commerce and that was a red flag for us and we said that if you have to put in money in this company this particular business which they have has to be hived off to another entity which will not have uh, fdi a foreign investment because it's not compatible with the regime and if you put in money in this tomorrow this can be problematic for you so we did it we restructured the transaction for them and as part of the structuring of the transaction you know we they went for a court approved demerger and they demerged that entity to a separate business and that's how we uh, progressed so yes it helps you in structuring also as at times and that's it utility of the due diligence report <clears throat> like it's a final decision of the transaction so ultimately what we do is that once this due diligence is done there are two three things firstly is your final decision on this how is it impacting the transaction is there a price adjustment is there a specific indemnity or is it a walk away now price adjustment in a lot of times you know if as a lawyer you're able to find something for your client which leads them to you know actually lead to a price adjustment i think you know nobody will be happier no client will be happier than that so we've done that in the past you know in this one transaction when we were buying a company the company had a lot of factories one factory we were able to figure out that that factory was a not contributing to the business because that factory had been like you know they'd been lying vacant for a long time and b the land on which that factory was there that was a disputed land on which a dispute had been going on for the longest time and there was a chance that you know, the court would uh, side in favor of the other the opponents rather than them because you know that was a tribal land and uh, there was some way through which that company had originally bought that land which was not correct so there was a lot of issues which came up in that part of the, uh, the transaction so we put a red flag to the client saying that you know this is what has come up and this is what it is so as part of the commercial discussions they figured out that you know it's best for us that we exclude this factory because a it's not contributing to the overall uh, business as it is it's been lying vacant for the longest time and as part of the valuation of the business they've put in i think a few crores i don't remember the exact amount it's 20 25 crores of the value they've put for this factory land so if that land itself is disputed and it's of no use to us because you know the uh, it's a vacant factory land which is there then we might as well exclude it from the business from as part of the transaction and take a purchase price adjustment of 25 crores so you know the fact that you we were able to save that amount of money and find that issue for them and save that money for the client you know they became a regular client for us so this is obviously it, it really helps if you can do that for the client the other thing is there is a sometimes a lot of pushback from the sellers if you want to do a purchase price adjustment for every issue that you find so if there is a five litigations which are going on and those five litigations are running and i will so and say the maximum potential liability in those litigations against me is oh, whatever 40 crores or 50 crores i would so you know the buyer will say that you know what i'll do is i'll adjust 50 crores up front and if tomorrow i end up losing those cases then i'll pay that money myself i won't bother you and i'll up front cut the money from what i'm paying you but the seller pushes back saying that listen there is it is highly unlikely that tomorrow these cases will be uh, decided against me i we have very strong cases so let these be a specific indemnity item and let me conduct the cases let me give me the conduct of claims so that i can run the management of these cases appoint my lawyers do everything let me run these cases because i know we can easily win these cases and if at all you know at that time you end up losing and there's a court order against you we'll pay the amount that is there we'll indemnify you for your loss we'll give a specific indemnity but there is no upfront price adjustment because i'm 100% sure that these cases are very they don't have strong cases against you 
So you have an, in the, and this is just one example. There are a lot of discussions which take place. So you can either take a specific indemnity on those issues or there's a price adjustment. Walkaways, obviously, you find something so major or so drastic that it doesn't make sense for the person to actually invest in the company in itself. You know, there's so many issues in the company. Uh, you know, once we were uh, doing this uh, company, uh, for a case for this company, in which the person uh, was, they were all set to buy the company, but you know, after the due diligence was done, they decided against it because there were so many non-compliances in that company. That company had been running for the past 15 years. They, in the middle, what had done was for three, four years, that company had not filed its annual returns, but apparently their accountant was not doing something. So they had not filed their annual returns because of which the ROC sent a notice for strike off to them. Then their company was struck off in between. Then they had to go to court and revive that company. Once that company was revived, after that, it went into insolvency. When it went into insolvency, the promoters of the company bought back the company. It was one of those rare instances where the promoters, they went to the COC, which is the commission, committee of creditors. They took 90% approval and the promoters ended up buying that company back as part of the insolvency process. Now, this was before the amendments came into place, which prohibit the promoter to actually buy back the company. Now. But what happens is that under the insolvency act, when a promo say when in, you are buying the company through an insolvency process, all the past claims and all the past liabilities, they get extinguished to the extent that, you know, all these litigations and all, you can't come after the new buyer who's buying the company through that insolvency process. But because in this case, the promoters themselves have bought back the company as part of the insolvency process, <laughs> that uh, refuge or that safe harbor was not available to them. So we highlighted a lot of these things to the client that, you know, because the A, the reason they went into insolvency was there was a lot of litigation against them. Even if they've been able to come back out of litigation, it's not all hunky-dory for them because these act provisions of the IBC will not apply to them because, you know, it's not a new management which has taken place. It's the old promoters which have come back. I think it's section 32A of the insolvency code which says that. So they've come back. So that's not possible. And then we highlighted a range of issues for them. So even though to begin with, the business looked very lucrative to them and, you know, it seemed like a good opportunity, but when they saw that, you know, it comes with so much headache, they did a walk away and they simply told them that what we can do and what we can consider is that if you create a new company, sell all the business of this company to that new company, set it up. And then once you have a clean new company uh, set up, then we can consider buying that company. But we will not put in money and we will not buy this existing company, which has come, which comes with so much historic liability. So these are things which happen, you know, and these are things which come up in diligences and because of which transaction structures change or, you know, people walk away. Possible relook at structuring we've already decided, uh, discussed. Informed drafting. <coughs> Again, these things which you do, you've done a due diligence, you've figured out a lot of these things which are there. And uh, after that, you categorize them. There are certain things which are conditions precedent and some things which are conditions subsequent. Condition precedent means that it's a, uh, it is a it is conditional upon the seller to fulfill and to rectify these 10 faults that are found or these 10 things if the seller does. Then only or then will I put in money and buy the company. If you've not been able to complete these conditions precedent in the next 60 days, after that, we will then we can walk away from the deal because you've not been uh, able to hold your end of the bargain. Now, these condition precedents are generally rectifying the faults which we found during the due diligence process. We have found that they did not have these 10 licenses or these five licenses. So we either tell them that as a condition precedent, you go and obtain these licenses. A, B, if the transaction is such that, you know, we have to proceed ASAP and you have to, we want to put in money in the next 30 days. And obviously given the government procedure and processes and, you know, say, imagine because it's a COVID situation, it's taking more time. They're not able to get it in 30 days. Then we can negotiate the application, uh, the condition precedent and make it a condition precedent for them to apply for that license so that at least the applications are filed. And a condition subsequent that post we've put in money, there is an obligation still on you to follow up with the authorities and help us get that application. So 
differently things are done so you have a condition precedent and a condition subsequent accordingly you make these things that this is what requires is required to be done in order for us to put in money and buy out the company these are conditions you need to fulfill representations and warranties now representations and warranties also you know uh, while these terms are generally used interchangeably in india and typically everybody gets a reps and warranty package there are different a representation is defined as something a statement which you are giving as of date of a fact as an inducement to the buyer to enter into a contract i am making a representation to you that you know the company does not have any claims the company does not have any uh, litigation the company has been doing very well these are statements i am making to you as an inducement for you to come and invest in the company or buy out the company a warranty is an implied promise to indemnify in case that statement is wrong so i will you know so it's see like i said they use interchangeably but the technical difference is that if it's a representation you can sue for misrepresentation and under the contract act for misrepresentation you can rescind the contract that is you can unwind the transaction as for a misrepresentation but for a breach of warranty so there is a breach of warranty you are only uh, obligated to indemnify under the agreement so that's a technical difference which a lot a lot of people actually put in and you would see in transaction documents as all representations and warranties but if i am from a seller side i would always push that my documents only say warranty as compared to representation and warranty because under law for a misrepresentation you have a rescindment right also you can rescind the transaction and unwind the transaction but for a warranty your right even in the court of law will be limited to the indemnity or damages which are there but how does our due diligence help us in uh, uh, you know structuring the reps and warranties because then as part of when i'm drafting the representations and warranties basis what all i've seen now what happens is a lot of times when i'm uh, doing a due diligence exercise the company tells me that okay you know currently we are not being able to find a particular document but we have made all the labor law compliances right so i will tell them fine under the uh, the transaction documents i am taking a representation from you that the company does not have uh, any you know claims against it in relation to violation of labor laws the company has conducted its business in compliance with all applicable labor laws and similarly crafted different representations and warranties is what i'll take from them in the transaction documents you know and uh, say in this uh, particular instance that i was telling you that we came to know that they have a, a set of business which is in you know maybe construed as contract manufacturing so even after the business was hived off in the transaction documents we took a, a representation from them that they do not carry out any contract manufacturing business so that's particular statement we took uh, as part of the representation package because this is an issue which we found this was an issue which was from the transaction perspective so we would want you to give it to us in writing that uh, as you know as a representation and warranty that there is nothing like this as of date in the company again the idea is that so that you have a, you are creating a right that they've made a written statement so tomorrow if it's untrue you can sue them for indemnity under the contract and obviously you can go for damages as well a lot of times what happens is that because i as a lawyer what i would want is that i want to protect my client the seller that it should not be that you sue me for damages also in court of law and then you go for indemnity under the contract as well correct so what we say a lot of times in order to limit the liability of the seller is that indemnity shall be the exclusive monetary remedy that you have and it's not like you can actually you know sue me in court as well and then go for the indemnity procedure under the contract so your only monetary liability will be what you have agreed to in the indemnity process with the limitations in the contract so that's how this helps us and specific indemnities is already discussed how our diligence process helps us figure out what are the uh, key issues for which we require specific indemnities going forward so this is how your diligence process will help you you know in your drafting as well and we'll see going in more detail in the next session when we're doing transaction document drafting how that works out and review of a disclosure letter now what is a disclosure letter again you have given me a laundry list of representations and warranties which say things like you know that you want me to confirm that the company does not have any litigation against it the company has not taken any loans the company is not part of any litigation etc etc 
but i also as a seller want an opportunity to give you a disclosure letter in which i will disclose whatever is there against the warranties so if this warranty in the transaction document that you want me to give to you is the company does not have any loans in the disclosure letter i will have the opportunity to say that okay i do not have any loans other than say the credit card dues which are uh, uh, you know payable against the companies as of this date or other than the small unsecured loan which we have taken from a director whatever it is the idea is that i am being upfront that you cannot sue me for fraud tomorrow for a breach of uh, you know warranty or a representation so the idea is that they give me a lot of a disclosure letter setting out all these facts now, as a lawyer when this disclosure letter comes to you and you've already done your diligence you know what should you accept and what you should not accept because if it's something which was not told to me as part of the diligence process and today you all of a sudden you throwing this bomb and saying that oh this is a disclosure that you're making then that's problematic and then that is something i'll red flag to my client saying that you know we've been interacting it with him for the past 3 months we've been doing a diligence exercise at that time he did not disclose this but today in a disclosure letter when two days after you planning to put in money he's disclosing that this is also there so once you've done your proper diligence you've done your work it's easy for you to review the disclosure letter as well the idea is that the disclosure letter acts qualifies the warranties so you cannot sue the person for anything which is given in that disclosure letter obviously as a buyer if you're not okay with what is being disclosed in the disclosure letter and you're not it's not acceptable to you you will not go ahead with the transaction you will not put in money it's as simple as that utility of legal due diligence report from an investor perspective informed decision making we discussed that a certaining liabilities again we discussed uh, how does that uh, happen assistance in valuation negotiations like we were discussing your purchase price adjustments which happen and you know a lot of these assumptions are there that this may happen this may not happen you know a lot of times and you know uh, i'm just giving you examples from real estate because it's easier for you to relate to it because in one transaction what happened was that we figured that when the company a lot of its real estate property for which we are paying money is uh, situated in a land which as per uh, you know our resources and what we know is that the government is in the process of declaring that as a green land or you know or it was part of a green land today where you could not do construction but tomorrow it may uh, be changed and it may be rezoned so you will be able to uh, carry on a, a set up a factory over there or you won't be able to set up a factory over there so basis these inputs which you gave it helps them in valuation negotiations because then they'll say that okay tomorrow this land will be useless to us so why do we pay for it up front etc etc so there are a lot of things you help them with assistance in valuation negotiations you figure out that there is a huge uh, litigation which is going on and you know if it uh, is decided against the company it may lead to such a huge amount of loss then you again go back to them and tell them that like, oh, you this these are points which you can use to negotiate a better deal for yourself get more discount on the company so this is how you and from an investor perspective again like i said risk allocation risk allocation is very important from both the buyer side and the seller side because you want to limit your liability as a seller you want to limit your liability as a buyer you want to limit your liability and most of the negotiations that take place are to find that common ground where both of them can you know try and limit their liability to the maximum extent possible from a seller's perspective now this due diligence process is not only to help the buyer out and figuring out what are the problems and historic liabilities in the company he or she is investing in it is also equally important from the target's perspective right the target's perspective is very important because you get to disclose to the investor you are being very upfront and transparent that this is all that is you know that that investor wants to invest in your company he's seeing he or she is seeing a huge you know potential in what your company is doing so you want to disclose upfront everything that see this is what it is now you make a decision whether or not you want to buy it you avoid fraud and misrepresentation claims later so that nobody can come and tell me that oh you know you were misleading me or you know this is what you told me but this is not what the case is so you 
want to be transparent and you want to give them a fair opportunity to do their due diligence give them all the data dump give them all the documents so that tomorrow you know you can always tell them that listen i gave you all my litigation papers i gave you everything that was there you you could have easily read over there it was written that you know as part of that litigation case that is against me one of the things that they are alleging is that or one of the prayers that they want is that they wanted a certain part of my shares as well it was all there i have given you each and every document you know you want to be uh, uh, that uh, kind of transparency you want to maintain because tomorrow you don't want somebody to uh, you know claim for fraud or damages against you in this presentation claim if your compliance level is already good you pay help in valuation negotiations because if i have run my company i know that i have run my company in a brilliant manner i have had a very good team so you know and there are no non com legal non compliances we don't have any litigation against us we've been filing all our labor compliances on time our companies that compliances are top notch there is no problem so you would more confident and exposing them to say that you know go on check see what all is there and let me know what do you want me to do and if because of it's that the case <clears throat> you know you see if that's the case you go ahead with it and that will help you with your valuation negotiations as well because that will help you get a better price for your company because you've run it in a very nice way and you're giving them a very clean company and from your pastellus perspective if there are any gaps in compliances these can be addressed you know sometimes people who have good intentions they're very happy if you actually come and point out to them that okay you know we've done a proper legal audit on you and we've you know looked at everything that you've done and we've seen all your compliances all your contracts everything that you've entered into and these are the 10 15 areas which we think are the gaps in your compliance structure so you will be happy to rectify them because sometimes you know it's not like you were doing it intentionally but it's un intentionally because you're not aware of what is happening and it this was a requ legal requirement under law or you know there was maybe there was some new notification which came up which was not brought to your notice so you're just very happy to rectify those faults as well so it helps everybody types of <coughs> uh, you know legal due diligence and what are the scope of legal due diligence now your type of legal due diligence again it depends on the type of client as well now if you have a client who's a financial investor pe funds vc funds etc then it's a different thing now what does a financial investor is not buying the company a financial investor is only planning to put in a certain amount of money in order to get a better return 2 years 3 years or 5 years later so they have a short term uh, implication of things and also they're not putting in a lot of um, they're not buying the company so maybe they're not interested in knowing if the company has filed a small uh, form under companies act or not they don't need all the compliances what they will need is for you to look for big ticket items they would need for you to make sure that a if you're buying the shares the title of the shares is correct right what is the title of the shares now you know the title of see title of the shares is ownership of the shares right now under the companies act your if your name is written on the register of members of the company and you have a share certificate in your hand which gives your name then you have proper ownership of the company right or if the shares were transferred to you you should have a duly stamped and signed properly executed share transfer form and the share certificate should have a back endorsement on it back endorsement is at the back of it the company you know it should have been written that this share certificate was transferred from a to b on this date it should be signed by one of the directors of the company and it should have the company seal or stamp on it so you look for these things to see you know the, what is the title of the shares if are all the foreign compliances you know fema compliances in place etc etc so your type of uh, you are limited it's a limited scope just to make look for your red flag items which are there and just to make sure that you know there is no impediment on the investment rise of now because if you're not buying the company you don't want to know each and everything you don't want to know that you know maybe it was a 500 rupee chalan which one of the drivers of the company had against him or her you don't you're not interested so it's a different perspective but from a strategic investor who's trying to buy the company so those investors want to know everything because you're buying the company you want to know exactly what it is you want to know what is happening in the company so you want a much more detailed report from us so we obviously depending on what your intention behind that investment is your uh, the idea is different sub categories vendor due diligence acquire due diligence majority and minority vendor due diligence like i was telling you to begin with a vendor due diligence is when you 
our, uh, when the company calls us and says that okay you conducted diligence on us let us know what are the gaps that we have in our functioning what are the compliance gaps etc now the advantage of a vendor due diligence report why companies get it done is a that say you are looking as a company for a huge investment round or you are looking to sell off your company to a buyer you would want to preempt what all issues will their lawyers find so you call a tier one law firm you want to you call a good law firm themselves you ask them to conduct that diligence and give them they will give you a report once they give you a report you know that these are the type of issues which any lawyer looking good lawyer which they hire will find in your company you start rectifying those issues to the extent possible and then you ask us you know that okay these you had identified these 20 issues we have started rectified 10 of these issues and for the other 10 these are the steps that we've taken to rectify these issues so then you get that report you know then you modify the we change that report amend that report based on these things have been done then you remove the things which they've rectified etc etc and you make a proper due diligence report and when that is given to a prospective buyer who's coming so anybody's trying to buy the company i will tell them that okay you know great that you can do your own diligence as well but what we've also done is that we've gotten a diligence vendor due diligence done from this uh, law firm highly reputed law firm this is their report and as you can see most of the things are in order but you are free to go and do your own due diligence as well you're more confident in that case because you already know what are the type of things their lawyer can also find and you've already started a process of rectifying them so vendor due diligence report is also something you know a lot of companies go for if they and especially if you're calling for bids so if you're calling for bids where you are actually you know uh, asking a lot of buyers to come and uh, give their prospective prices what they want you will need to help them also make a better valuation of the company in which case it is good for you that to have a legal vendor due diligence report from a reputed law firm so that which you can give to those prospective buyers Uh, saying that you know we've gotten this done please look at it and see what decision you want to make yes pankaj you have a question i think it's by mistake then buyer due diligence is also of two types like we discussed majority mm-hmm. majority yeah so your acquire due diligence uh, again acquire due diligence is when the buyer asks you to do a due diligence that is typically the type of due diligence that we mostly do is when the buyer is buying a company and they want you to have a look at it at the target again the scope of it depends on the majority and minority if it's a majority investment you want a much more detailed report as compared to a minority investment where you are fine with you know just knowing the big ticket items which are there the sub categories for both are one uh, is a one country legal due diligence reports and country specific section of a larger legal due diligence now again this due diligence also in these transactions a lot of times what happens is that we and we get a lot of this work from a lot of foreign law firms say uh, that what is happening in a lot and recently also a lot of these it ites companies they have global offices their client and everything is done globally but they have wholly owned subsidiaries in india which basically act as back end offices because you know they have this back end offices here in bangalore where they have an it team sitting which helps them with back end you know all their software development and everything back end over here it helps them but the main selling of the product everything else front end is being done uh, you know uh, overseas so when the global transaction takes place that overseas company is being bought now when the overseas company is being bought there is no direct change of control in india but there is an indirect change of control and obviously because as part of the transaction they are also getting the indian company so those companies come to us and these foreign law firms you know these uh, your white and case and these other law firms they come to us and they say that can you please do a country specific diligence that we are, this company has subsidiaries in spain mexico australia india etc etc so we have hired law firms in every country obviously the direct transaction is taking place outside india so you transaction documents we can look at but what we need your help is to conduct a diligence on the indian company the indian subsidiary so the scope of that becomes more restricted in the sense obviously you have to do a proper diligence because they're buying the company but you know things some things you can overlook as well because some things are not that major or they don't have they're not material from that perspective because there's an indirect change happening i'll tell you what so if you do not have a share certificate 
Now, if there is no share certificate, that can create a problem at the time of share transfer because you need to back endorse the share certificate as part of the share transfer process. So in a transaction where I'm directly buying the company, so then obviously then it becomes problematic and it's a huge, it's a big red flag for me as a condition precedent for them to get a proper share, duly stamped share certificate and pay all the stamp duty properly on it because you without it, you can't transfer. But in an indirect uh, transfer of shares, the sh that shares will not be bought. So it can be dealt with as a housekeeping issue post buying the company that the company can issue that share certificate and get it done. So obviously your perspective changes and the materiality of the issue changes, whether based on that situation of the transaction. So generally that's the type. So either you do it specifically for that company, if the company is being bought or as part of this global transaction or this global deal, it's just one of the India legs, which is there. And that's how you go about it. So it's an indirect transfer. So if you can proceed formats, different, different types of legal due diligence reports that you're required to make. So there is a summary based report. There is an issues based report, memorandum, India leg of global diligence and top up report. Summary based report is the one which is the most detailed report, which nowadays has become somewhat archaic because a lot of these companies, their management, their CEOs, everybody, they don't have the time, they don't have the patience and they don't have the bandwidth to go through a 500 page report. But some companies still want that done as part of their records. So because if they're buying a company, so what that will entail is that they will ask us to make a detailed reporting of each and everything in the company. If I've reviewed a contract, I will make a summary of the key terms of that contract. So because if it's a hundred page contract, I'll make a five pager key no, a key summary of the key terms of that contract and then attach it to the due diligence report. So it's a proper, you know, fact based reporting of everything that is there in the company. And then we make a detailed report. So that's the four, 500 pager report, which is there. But nowadays what has happened is that everybody, what we are shifting towards is mostly an issues based report in which I don't need to summarize those uh, that 100 page document for you every 100 page document that I've reviewed. But if I found a red flag in that report, now if I found a red flag in that contract, then I highlight it to you. Say if I'm reviewing the contract that this company has entered into with a consultant, which is fine, that's fine. You don't need to know everything that is there in the contract. But if that contract has a term which says that that consultant, if that consultant has worked with the company for more than five years, after that, that consultant is entitled to 10% equity in the company. Now, if there is such a clause which is there, then what the client needs to know is just about that one clause. Or if that uh, uh, clause says that, you know, because this consultant has worked in uh, improving or in, in increasing the valuation of the company over a period of time, in case there is a new funding round which comes or in case there is a change in control in the company, that consultant is required to be paid a success fee by the company. Again, this is something which is out of the ordinary. It is It has monetary implications. This becomes something which you highlight to the client that, okay, so you know, this is there. This is one thing. And, you know, some things, things like this is what the client will want to know. And not, they would not be bothered because they will tell me that, okay, you are the lawyer. If you are fine with everything else, you are fine with everything else. You tell me things which you think are, you know, are problematic and we will get, uh, we will work with the opposite side to rectify those things. Because see, from business perspective, law sometimes becomes an impediment because the business team wants to close the transaction. So they don't have time and everything is, you know, very fast paced. So they don't have the time for you to, to read a huge report. They will tell you, I want a red flags only high level due diligence report. Just tell me what are the main issues and let's work towards getting them. I want the big ticket items only. Don't tell me that, you know, 500 rupees cars, we have a chalan or there is a thousand rupee penalty or there's a 10,000 rupee penalty. I don't care. You know, I've had transactions where there was, you know, the quantum of the transaction was so huge that the buyer's counsel, you know, the buyer's CEO has told me that, you know, Siddharth, uh, even if it's a few thousand dollars, it's, you know, small change as compared to the transaction document. So please tell me, keep a materiality of hundred thousand dollars for me. So if it's anything more than 70 lakhs or one crore, which is there, just highlight that to me. Otherwise we don't care. We'll handle it when we buy the company. People have that uh, thing also, depending on how things are. India leg of the due, global due, memorandum is like a normal diligence. It's just a different format. It's, it's also a detailed format only. 
India leg of global due diligence is what we've already discussed, in which in these cases, what generally happens is that the foreign law firm, say a Whiten case or you know, uh, any other law firm, they'll have, or a Denton or any other law firm, they'll have their own format of a diligence report. They'll give it to you. And you just need to plug in your India section in that due diligence report, or they give you the liberty to make your own report. But ultimately, it's an indirect uh, transfer which is happening because the transaction is happening outside India. And the only reason they want you to do a due diligence is because they have an India subsidiary, which as part of acquiring the main parent company, they'll also be acquiring. So they just need a clean um, you know, bill of health over there. Top up report. A lot of times what is happening, like I said, in this bid process, now we did a uh, vendor due diligence report or somebody has done a vendor due diligence report. And as part of the bid, we've gotten that I am now the buyer's counsel. I have gotten the report that, okay, that, okay, you're in Khetan. Now say an Amar Chand or some other law firm had done the vendor due diligence report. Now we've gotten their vendor due diligence report. So the vendor due diligence report was dated June. This was dated June. We are sitting now in December. Six months have passed since then. So when we are buying the company, so, and it's taken that much time for the bid process to take place, for the commercial people to sit, finally decide on a number, et cetera, et cetera, all this time has taken place. Now they will, the company will ask me to do a top-up diligence. And what will be a top-up diligence? I will do a diligence for those six months, which are there. So you do a diligence only for that top remaining six months. Then life becomes easier for me. I know that you see, Amachand had done this diligence as of June. 2021 until to June 2021, these were the issues. So you ask them whether they've rectified those issues or not. You only look at new things which have happened in the past six months, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So a top-up diligence makes your life easier that way. Discussion items, focus areas, look back period. Now, <clears throat> obviously, when you're discussing starting a due diligence, it becomes very important for you to have a discussion with your client as to what is the scope of what you're looking for. Now, is it not that I have started looking for it and you say the time is that you want me to just focus and close everything in two weeks. So what are the areas you want to look at? You know, sometimes clients are very forthcoming and they say that, okay, no, but I am buying this company. I am buying this company because this company has this software. This software that the company makes is why we are buying this uh, company. And while you look at everything else, please make sure that everything in relation to this software is in place, including the contracts with the people who have developed this uh, software. Those contracts should clearly say that once they have developed this software, all the IP in the software, all the rights in the software get transferred to the company and they have no rights whatsoever on it. So because I want complete ownership of this, make sure that if all the copyrights and patents in relation to this are registered, make sure there is no you know objection which has been raised. There is no litigation. There is no third party infringement claim against us. There's no infringement claim against the company. So make sure everything else. So they tell us that, you know, this is the reason why we are buying the company. So make sure that there is no problem in this. Look at everything else as well. But yeah, this is what I want you to focus on. So that also helps you when you look at the documents, you you know, having that perspective of what the client wants really helps you while you're looking at the documents and you're conducting the diligence. The look back period. Now this company has been placed for 20 years. It is nobody's case that you will be expected to look at documents which date back 20 years, which are no longer even used then what's the use of having that you know document it's it wastes everybody's time generally for a due diligence we have a look back period of 3 years so you see if the company has been compliant with all the laws in the past 3 years and what is happening in the past 3 years is that's all you look at you don't go into 5 years 10 years 15 years 20 years the only things for which you do dig back deeper is if you want to look at the title of the shares Obviously, if I'm buying the shares, I want to look at a clean title. For that, we have to see from initially, ab initio, when the shares were bought and sold, if everything was done properly, if all the stamp duty was paid, if everything does done properly. For that, you have to have a look back period till that area. But other than that, you are not uh, required to look at everything. So generally, we discuss a look back period with the client that see, we see everything has been done in the past three years and then that's fine because generally as a limitation of liability most of the things have a three-year limitation of liability so we try and keep that cut off for ourselves 
exclusions and thresholds now this company has a lot of cases so say you are in like i said you're in a food manufacturing business or you're in any other particular type of business so you will have hundreds of thousands like or we were buying this uh, you know football club recently there that football club there you will have so many player complaints or we were buying this gaming company so you have a lot of user complaints which are there now you can't expect the legal team you know it's uh, a use of nobody's time to go through all those 5000 or 10000 user complaints or you know gaming complaints which are there with the users file which them so we put a materiality threshold so we ask the client that what materiality threshold do you want us to follow so the client will tell you that listen i think from the size of the transaction just focus on uh, claims where the claim is more than say 10 lakhs or the claim is more than 1 crore just focus on those claims that's all i want to know so then we we'll ask the sellers to just give us a list of all the claims or all the cases against them where the materiality is more than a certain amount or if it's a huge company it's a you know huge group of companies now it will have a lot of contracts because of then your day to day working you can't review each and every contract there are thousands of contracts so you put a materiality threshold to it and you just want contracts where the revenue of the company exceeds a certain amount or you say that give me contracts with your top 10 customers and your top 10 suppliers so you try and limit it based on the materiality it it's cost effective for the client and it's time efficient for you outline of the report obviously up front you discuss with the client that what exactly does the client want you want a summary based report you want an issues based report what exactly is it that you are looking for having these discussions up front they help everybody because then you know there are no confusions the client also knows what you uh, you are giving him and what he or she or she he or she should expect from you and you also know what to work towards and the mode of data sharing you know data sharing nowadays it's become very we are very clear about what we want we want a vtr we want a virtual data room in which you upload everything and please give us you know the right to print the documents or the right to do something on the documents because otherwise it becomes very problematic for us so you want a structured platform where people are sharing the data you want them to make a virtual data room and then put in all the documents in that virtual data room which are there so that is something which we always you know uh, we focus on so you would discuss the mode of data sharing who will we be coordinating with we generally as part of it we will send you a initial requisition list that these are the 100 things you know it's a laundry list of items these 100 items which we want from you so we send that list to you and then accordingly you start putting the documents in the data room for us so that we can map what document is what so these are things you know you discuss up front with the client and the counterparty so in order to run a smooth process now what are the chapters in these due diligence report and what we'll do is that we'll quickly just see what all to look for in what all chapters are there So there's corporate compliance, there's material contracts, <clears throat> there's a regulatory chapter, finance chapter, real estate chapter, employment chapter, intellectual property, litigation, and insurance. Now corporate compliances. Now when as a you as a lawyer are, are are required to make a due diligence report and say you've joined the firm, the partner has told you that okay, you know you are going to be looking at the corporate chapter of the report. What do you look for in the corporate chapter? firstly you would want to know what is the group structure of that company what is the company have is it only that there is only one company or does that company have any other further step down subsidiaries which are there because then you will have to look at the compliances of the subsidiaries as well so you try and figure out what all is the shareholding of the company you need to know what is the shareholding of the company because you know and this happened uh, to us around i think it's uh, it happened around 3 years ago and this client of ours so they were trying to buy the company they wanted to buy a company they met the seller in davos and they wanted to buy this company and this was a, the our client was a german client and they were very excited that you know we met this person in davos and you know they are selling this company in india and they were quite very excited and they said because that uh, 
company had gotten uh, a license at AMTZ, which is this uh, you know new software park and city which was coming up. And they said that everything is in place of that company. And they did a research about the company, and they were very excited about the India collaboration. So they came to us, and you know, so they then we started doing the diligence. So as part of the so firstly, what we checked was we checked the records on the MCA, the website of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs showed their shareholder as of March of the previous year, because the new financial statements were yet to be filed. But it was showing the shareholding as the March of previous year to be two some two different people and not the people they were discussing it with. So we told this to the client. So the client said, "No, no, it might have changed after that." so we asked them to bring some documents to us show the documents to us. what happened was that it appeared that see the register of members of that company showed some other people as the shareholders the share certificates were issued in the name of those people and these people who were claiming to be the owners all they had was a letter which they had signed 4 years ago which said that you know after a point of time they just have a right to the shares so we told the client that see legally i don't know what that document is is that a correct document or not as well but until and unless they don't exercise that right and they don't get the shares and then you don't have a property their name is not registered in the register of members of the company and the share certificate of the company they are not the owners of the company so they cannot sell you what they don't have right so these are type of things to you look for in a diligence you see the ownership of the company you see said if the company has received foreign investment everything has been done properly they filed the form fc gpr or the form fc trs whatever rbi compliances are required to be done if you know if every your share certificates which have been issued to you as a, a title document they have been properly stamped your share transfer forms which are there those have been properly stamped etc etc so these are corporate compliances ownership of the sellers the group structure if the company has any subsidiaries or not the description of the business of the target like we discussed it sometimes becomes very important you know just to be make sure that if the company does not have any small different side business which is not in compliance with the law because you know if you're buying the entire company you just want to be sure about what all businesses are there what are the exact scope of the business which is there so you check that and then the share capital build up see if the company only has equity shares or is it that i because see the sellers are only selling you equity shares but is it that the company has issued debentures to somebody or has uh, issued convertible notes to someone else which can tomorrow they can use their right to convert them into equity and then even if i am buying 100% equity right now my share may be reduced to just 90% because someone else has the right to convert his his or her convertible notes into 10% equity so that's something you need to show, make sure that what exactly is the share capital what are the different classes of share is it that the person you're buying the shares from has differential shares with differential voting rights which only allow which do not have any voting right attached to them in which case you know there is no valuation for those shares they are useless to you because even if you buy them all of those shares you don't have any voting right attached to them so you see what is the capital structure of the company you see what is the type of share capital that they've issued you see what is the type of Uh, you know a description of the business ownership of the shares etc etc these are things which you would uh, it's very important for you to have a look at material contracts now material contracts is again an an very important thing because when you have a company a company has its relationship with its uh, say uh, buyers it has with, with customers and it has suppliers right now if you buying a company you would want that the entire ecosystem of contracts that is there is in place and everything is running smoothly because even if the person in charge of that company is changing you have a proper contractual regime under which the companies will keep on working as you progress now say for example when i'm talking about the contractual matrix of a company if you have imagine it's a manufacturing plant that you have or a factory that you have firstly what is the document you will have because you have a factory in place there has to be uh, imagine that factory is in place so you have to have land for that factory now for that land you either taken it on loan uh, i'm so sorry loan i'm either taking on lease uh, or you bought the land so there will be a title document or there will be a lease document for that then you have plant and machinery which you have in that plant 
manufacturing plant. Now that plant and machinery, again, you will have some document for ownership of that. Either you're an owner, you have title documents, you've purchased it, you have invoices for that, or you've taken it on a lease or a hire lease agreement or stuff from somebody. So you will have that document to tell you what it is. Then as part of the manufacturing process, you will require raw materials. So you would have some service providers or you would have some vendors from whom you will be buying your raw materials. You would have these 10 key raw materials without which you cannot manufacture the products. So you as a lawyer would want that for each of those 10 uh, manufacturing those raw materials which are required, you have proper long term contracts with the vendors. So that tomorrow, if your client is buying the company, it's not like uh, those contracts can be terminated on day one and then the production stops because the idea is to have seamless business as in when you buy the company. So you would want them to have long term proper vendor contracts in place with all your um, leading raw material sellers. Then obviously you would want that once these manufactured, they are manufactured, the raw materials are there, the plant and machine using the plant and machinery, the final product is manufactured. It has to be sold to the customers. You are buying this company because you've been told that this, uh, you know, this company has these 10 biggest sellers, customers through whom they are selling products and because of which their revenue runs in some thousands of crores. Very good. It sounds very good on paper. But what you notice is that you would want to see their customer contracts with each and every of their sellers, uh, these customers which are there. Now, when they go to those customers, when I see that customer contract, I realize that these are short term contracts. These are all contracts which are renewed every three months. Now, what the thing was that you or your buyer is a foreign company. They don't have any roots in India. They don't have, you know, any, uh, they don't have that kind of rapport with these customers, which the original Indian seller had. Now they were doing it. They were running this business because they were renewing these contracts every three months basis, their personal relationship, which they had. But because there is an absence of any long term contract tomorrow, if your client ends up buying this company and in three months that contract expires, they don't have that personal relationship to, you know, renew it on the same terms. And maybe at that time they can uh, enter into a huge negotiation and end up, you know, getting some very inferior terms as compared to what has been negotiated right now. So you'll highlight it to your client and you will tell them that, you know, as part of this buying the company, make sure that the seller enters into long term contracts on these terms with all of its customers so that it's not a problem for you tomorrow and you don't have to renegotiate with them. So you, these are things you look at or what you look for is that do any of these contracts, uh, you know, uh, which are there, do they require a prior approval of those customers before buying the company? Because then it's a huddle for you. Uh, correct. So this is what you highlight that. How is it an impediment? Is there any change of control restriction? Do those contracts say that in case of a change of control, the customers can terminate the contract? Or do they say that, you know, in case of a change in control, you have to take the prior permission. These are things you try and figure out through the material contracts and you highlight to your client. Now, the material contracts may also be in uh, relation to, say, some uh, third party, which is manufacturing products for your client. So your client may be half its manufacturing facility they own, but other half they've outsourced to a third party manufacturer. Now, does that contract which they have with the third party manufacturer give them complete ownership of the product that the third party manufacturer is making? And do they have a right under that agreement to sell this product in their name? And then once that payment is made to the third party manufacturer, they will have, you know, no right over the product. Further, does it say that if there is any manufacturing defect in what their third manufacturer, third party manufacturer is, uh, uh, you know, has produced and you sell uh, end up selling that product and somebody sues you for that claim, do you have a back to back right against that third party manufacturer to, you know, counter sue them and or claim that money from them third man manufacturer because that is the default which has taken place at their end. So these are all the things which you will have to look at when you're looking at contracts, some of the contracts when you're looking at with all your customers and you know, Imagine you're in the, you know, food, your uh, client is in the food manufacturing industry and you are selling these products to all your distributors and big other big companies. So, you know, what is your liability exposure? Do those agreements say that your liability is capped, your indemnity or liability under those agreements is capped to an amount or do they say that you have unlimited liability? 
because then again that ex- adds to your liability exposure under each of those contracts and because you know that you know it's the line of the uh, ma- your line of business is such that there bound to be cases so you would want that those cases are you are liabilities ex- uh, restricted so you see what are the indemnity provisions you see if they have the right to equity in the company you see if they have any right to appoint directors or any other su- of such right over there do they have any right to claim for shares of the company is do, is there an obligation for them to take the permission for us to take the permission in case of a change of control etc etc so all these unusual things you look for in your material contracts and you would try to rectify them then is the regulatory chapter the regulatory chapter which is there is the one uh, you know where you see that if all the licenses permits etc which are required to run that company or the registrations and approvals which are required to run a company are they in place or not now this is very sector specific first thing which you need to do is to you need to know what sector your client is and what are the laws governing that sector what are the different different you know acts which govern that sector which are the different governmental authorities which are involved in that sector imagine that today if i am in your client you are the target which you are buying is in the sector of exporting software now when you are exporting software you know that you would uh, is know that okay because they are exporting software outside india the fema the foreign exchange management act and the rbi has some export rules import and export rules you look at the import and export rules and you figure out that for every every company or every individual who is exporting software outside india they need a registration as an stpi with they need to register themselves with an stpi which is a software technology park of india so either as an stpi unit or a non stpi unit and after that for all the amount of uh, you know exports that you've done for your software you uh, need to file a form softex with the rbi so this is something which you figure out as part of your you are a lawyer you figure out and then you ask the company as part of the diligence whether or not they have done softex filings and whether or not they have an stpi registration and ask them to show you the registration and give you a proof that they've been doing the softex filings for at least for the last 3 years right or you figure out that for every company now if they have like i said a manufacturing plant now every factory for you to run has to have a license under the factories act you have to register under the factories act then under the environmental laws for you to start operation of those factories under the air act and the water pollution act you need consents to operate ctos which are there you figure out whether those companies have taken those ctos or not based on the nature of the business if it's in say your company your target is in the insurance sector you will see that you know you will try and read up and you will figure out that the irda the insurance regulator has these set of regulations and you require registrations and approvals from all these authorities or from the irda to set up this business so does this company have all these licenses in place that is what you check or if it's just a shops and establishment do they have a shops and establishment license or not separate separate so there are different different types of legislations which are there and the regulatory and license you know chapter becomes tricky to some extent because every a lot of the laws in a country they are very state specific so while there is a central uh, act for it and there is a central authority there are also state authorities so you know there may be some state specific registrations that you require and uh, state specific exemptions which may be there to certain companies so you will have to be aware and you will have to read up and make sure and do your proper research to be sure that you are not skipping out on anything and there is nothing very state specific for that particular company and that is there <clears throat> the finance chapter the finance chapter is that obviously when you are buying a company you want to know whether or not that company has taken any loans right now whether or not that company has any encumbrances or over its assets whether it's mortgaged any asset and how is it that it is working what are the loan documents what are the covenants which are there in the loan documents does the loan document say that if you default on the loan they can convert the entire loan amount into uh, uh, your equity in the company does it say that in case of an event of default if you know the creditors can actually go and appoint directors on the company or remove directors of the company do the you know what are the repayment terms of as part of the loan 
is there any very high prepayment penalty because it's possible that as part of the transaction your you know your client may want to just buy the company and then clear all the debt but then you highlight to him that you know him or her that if you're buying this company at you know and if you try to prepay the loan you have a very high or very steep uh, you know prepayment uh, penalty of 20% which you have to pay so which may not make it then financially feasible for them to do that as part of the transaction or structure the transaction in such a way a lot of it and almost all your loan documents will have a clause which will say that in case of a change in control in the company for a change in control of the company you have to take the permission of the creditors so you look for all these uh, terms which are there you see what is the term of the loan you also want to see what all has been mortgaged as part of your property so is it that your entire property this you know you paying hundreds of crores for this company but the entire property of the company and all the assets of the company are already mortgaged to banks for these loans which are there so in which case you'll firstly have to figure out how are you going to repay those loans and how are you actually going to release those assets from mortgage and from a charge uh, with those lenders because you want to clean assets to be in first place so these are things which you look for in the loan documents and you'll highlight to your client that this is what it is these are the charges which are created on the property these are the loans which the company has taken you know these are the prepayment penalties which are there these are the consents which you require to uh, which are required to be taken from the lenders etc etc has the company made proper filings with the rbi uh, with the rbi and uh, with the ministry of corporate affairs in relation to all these loans and you know this is something which is common even from your uh, material contract chapter or your corporate compliance chapter or regulatory chapter is to make sure that the company uh, you know is required to do a lot of compliances with the nca or you know there are a lot of compliances which are required to be done with the rbi if you've taken loans and you know from a fema perspective those annual compliances are they being taken care of so imagine like for a company in india from a corporate compliance perspective the company's act says that you need to have a minimum of four board meetings a year one annual general meeting a year so you know has the company undertaken four board meetings and that that also one meeting every 120 days and there should not be a gap of more than that between two meetings etc etc so you try and make sure has the company done that to begin with has the company conducted its board meetings properly have those board meetings been conducted as per what the company's act says and what the secretarial standards which have been issued under the company's act has those board meetings been done in accordance with that yes or no do other shareholders meetings been done as per company's act then the companies act says that every company is required to file its audited financial statements with the roc the registrar of companies within a particular amount of time every year you try and figure out was that done was that done annually yes or no has the company been complying with that every company uh, which has uh, you know taken foreign investment or is thing exporting software will have to do certain filings with the rbi on an annual basis there is an fla form which is required to be filed with the rbi is that being filed on an annual basis yes or no also th- these are like annual compliances there are also certain event based compliances which are there right so are those event based compliances like as and when the company has received foreign investment has the company been regularly reporting things to the rbi when it's getting investments whenever there is share transfer taking place has the form sttrs been filed every time when that is happening except that except so you want to make sure that all these re- filings which are required to be done under the regulatory authorities all these filings under the companies act the companies act says that whenever you issue new shares of a company you have to file a, a form pass 3 with the roc has those have those forms been filed on time is there a delay the companies act also says that those acts you know those form filings are required to be done or those reporting requirements are required to be done within a period of 20 days or a period of 30 days from the act itself were those compliances done within 30 days yes or no so these are things you actually have to look at from a compliance perspective to see if the company has been running properly or not it's fine that they're doing good business it's fine that they're doing everything but have they been running properly or not and have these compliances been done or not on an annual basis or an event based basis as they are required to be done every special resolution that a company has that special resolution uh, uh you know has to be filed once you file a special resolution in a form mgd 14 
uh, MG, uh, MG14 after uh, within a particular amount of time, when, after the special resolution in 30 days. Had that been done or not, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you need to make sure from a compliance perspective that all of this is there. So especially then now, you know, similarly in case of financing, if you create a charge on the assets of a company, you have to make a filing with the uh, uh, ROC, the registrar of companies. And if I today want to check, it's a publicly available uh, document. I can check on the MCA portal to see what all assets of the company you've created a charge on, as long as you're making a filing with the MCA about it. Right. And I saw somebody was raising their hands. I think what is there is that we'll keep the last 15, 20 minutes for queries only. So we'll do that. I think let's just uh, finish this right now. <coughs> Finance we discussed. Then real estate. Your real estate, uh, when you're looking at the real estate chapter, your real estate chapter, like I said, so property is either you have your immovable property, you have you either own the property on a freehold basis or you've leased the property. It's on a lease or leave and license basis. You need to look at the do property documents which are there to make sure that everything is in order. In case of a lease agreement, a lease agreement should be properly stamped and registered and it should be a valid lease. So the term should have not expired and the, they should not, you know, you see if there are any uncommon terms, if there's a you know huge lock-in period that is there or, you know, and there's a huge penalty if you actually terminate this lease within the lock-in period or you actually want to see that the lease is not properly stamped or it's not properly registered. These are the issues which you highlight to the client going forward. And you want to see the leases in Ocean. And specifically, I think the most important thing to check in case of a lease is if it's properly stamped or not and it's properly registered or not. Again, under law, if the lease is of less than 11 months, and you know, then you're not required to register it. So these are things you obviously try and identify. And in case of title to the property, obviously, you know, we have a proper real estate team. So we look at the title of the doc document to see that is a clean title. We see for the past 30 years to see the title of the uh, you know property, how it's been transferred, if it's been transferred properly or not. What is the name of the owner, which is given in the local revenue, local records uh, of the uh, which are maintained by the authorities, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You do a proper title search, title diligence see the ownership documents are in place, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, if you're buying a company, you would want to know what a real estate it has, you know, and uh, everything is being done properly in relation to those uh, properties. Because, you know, there are a lot of environmental clearances and other uh, property uh, clearances which you require while buying certain amount of property. There's certain property or in certain areas which are, you know, earmarked for tribal land or tribal property over there. You know, if you see the company has bought the property over there, how has it been bought over there? You know, what was done to buy this thing and i've seen people do a lot of uh, you know different different things one company and it was a huge reputable company they bought they had bought land in a tribal area to one person you know i think many years ago and he was a tribal resident in that area and that resident at that time they would have paid him some money to sign the documents and do everything for that uh, particular property and for the past 20 years i think that person had no idea also that you know he had bought that property in his or her name and uh, the, those people are using that property and land over there. And it's only when you do the diligence that you flag this to the client. And we said it's highly risky. If that person may not do something, but if that person's children tomorrow come and claim that land from you, how will that work? So, you know, this is not a structure which is feasible. And uh, people do a lot, you know, uh, a lot of shady stuff you come to know when you actually start doing these transactions. But yeah, so these are things you need to look out for when real estate uh, sector which is there. Employment and the labor sector, you know, it becomes very cumbersome given the size of what is the size of the workforce that you have in Indian under, you know, Indian laws, most of these labor law compliances, they start kicking off or they trigger when you have more than 20 employees for the most of the laws that is there for labor laws. So you see from an employee perspective, there are five, six things that you need to be very sure of. Firstly, what are the employment contracts? What are the type of contracts that employee has with the company? In case of, you know, IT, ITS companies or in any company, uh, you know, in, for that case, it becomes very important that those contracts with the employees, they should have basic things like non-compete, non-solicit, owner confidentiality obligations, ownership of IP. 
that's very important from a buyer perspective that all the employees should have it in their contracts that whatever work they're producing for the company, whatever research they're doing for the company or whatever software they're developing for the company, whatever you know thing is being done by them for the company, it is on behalf of the company and whatever the work product is, that will be transferred or assigned to the company and the company has complete ownership about it. So if your documents do not have it, it's a huge red flag. You have to raise it to the client that you know there is no such provision in any of these documents that uh, they've entered into non-compete, non-solicit. These are basic things with the good stuff which you want to be there in any of the agreements which are there with the employees. You want the proper employment or contracts to be in place with all of your employees. And you don't want, you want to, uh, you know, look out for things like if the employee has any golden parachute payment which required to be paid, that if you're actually, you know, terminating that employee and then you have to give this huge compensation to them or if there's a change in control that employee is entitled to some additional share of the company etc etc so you see the employment contracts which they have secondly what you need to make sure is that what are how others see there are a lot of social welfare and you know employee welfare legislations which the government has now these employee welfare legislations are very state specific also but you have a you know and central uh, is there there's the epf which is employee provident fund there's the esi so you have the employee state insurance corporation Yes, I see, you know, so have the, has the employer been making regular contributions to them or not? Some states have state specific labor welfare funds to which contributions are required to be made. Have those contributions being made on a regular basis? Then you need to see facts like, you know, that gratuity or not. So every, gratuity is something which after five years you're required to pay to the employee, but it's an accruing uh, in expenditure. So if you're, we are doing a diligence, we generally ask them and how companies generally do is that they get an actuarial valuation report for every year for their gratuity and leave engagement liabilities. And basis that, uh, they, you know, provision in their financial statements that this is our liability on account of gratuity, that we have 100 employees who've been with us for more than five years. So if tomorrow they all of them decide to leave, this is the amount of gratuity money that is uh, we are we owe them. So they get these actual valuation reports done. There's a method on how you calculate gratuity. So those gratuity, you know, is that in place or not? What are the leave encashment policies of the company? You would also, as part of this, uh, you know, employee uh, employment chapter, you need to map the, uh, you know, from the company's perspective that under law, you are required to provide a certain number of leaves. The Maternity Benefit Act also says in case of pregnancy, for a maternity leave, they are, you know, or even a paternity leave, etc. These are the number of leaves which you minimum have to give to an employee. So are those leaves being given or not? You know, there is an obligation on a company having more than 50 employees in a building for that building to compulsory have a crutch facility. Is that being done or not? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So when it comes to you know all these leaves which are being given by the company, then does the company have a proper posh policy in place? Because that is again uh, mandated by law for you to have a proper posh policy in place. Then for any sexual harassment claims which are coming, does the company have a proper uh, you know ICC in place, which is an independent uh, committee, uh, internal uh, committee which has to be made mandatorily as part of the act. Is that in place? Does that committee have external members at as, ma as is mandated by the law? So there are, you know, a bunch of things which you need to look at from an employment perspective, just to be sure that, you know, uh, how is it being done? If the company is making regular contributions for PF and, uh, you know, EPF, ESI, are they registered for EPF, ESI? Is everything being done properly when it comes to that, your gratuity payments, etc. So these are a lot of, you know, a host of things which you have to look for in an employment chapter. Intellectual property, firstly, you know, like I said, it's very important because a lot of these companies, you know, their valuation is mostly based on their IP. Now, today, if I'm buying a, say, huge company, say, imagine a Haldiram, if I'm trying to buy, you know, most of the value, obviously, of that uh, company comes from the brand name and the brand recognition, correct? Now, if that brand name and that brand recognition is in itself under doubt, or if there is any claim of third party infringement on that brand or that ownership of that brand is not registered itself, that means tomorrow anybody can start using it and we'll have to file litigations to say that we've been using it beforehand, etc, etc. That's a huge red flag. 
So you need to make sure that the IP is in place. If the company has, you know, is making this brilliant, uh, you know, some product, does that have a copyright? Does it have the patent for it? Is it registered or not? What stage of registration is it on? Is there anybody who's objecting it? Are there any cases which have been filed against that trademark or, you know, that intellectual property for any, uh, you know, somebody saying that you've infringed our intellectual property? How is that working? So you need to be make sure for intellectual property. Also, for when it comes to intellectual property, again, you need to make sure that all your contracts, wherever, uh, you know, uh, make sure and that the ownership of the intellectual property remains with you. Even if you've, uh, you know, uh, taken any third party consultant to manufacture, you know, to develop that software for you or to help you develop that software for you, that ownership should be 100% with you also. Again, there are a lot of softwares which you utilize as you know intellectual property, which are licensed. Do you have proper legal licenses for those softwares or not, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're using any open source software to develop anything for your company, do you, you know, is it being used through proper channels or not? So these are a lot of things which you need to look from an IP perspective. Each other. Litigation, again, in that chapter, you need to make sure what are the cases which have been filed against the company. What is the maximum exposure of the company in relation to all of these litigations which are there? You know, what is the maximum exposure which is there against the company? How much liability can there be against the company when it comes to litigation? Uh, what are the type of cases? Are they criminal cases? Are they civil cases? Is it something that, you know, where the court can tomorrow go? Is it a type of case or is it a type of case where as an implication, the court can pierce the corporate wheel and, uh, veil and, you know, in, uh, pierce the corporate veil and instead of, you know, going after, they can go after the management or the shareholders of the company instead of putting a penalty on the company. What is happening? So, etc., etc., you have to look at the type of litigation which are there. Lastly is the insurance section. Obviously, you would want that all of this, uh, you know, all your risks of the company, all the assets of the company, they're properly insured. So your insurance becomes very important. In that case, just to show that the company has a valid insurance, it's subsist valid and subsisting insurance. And all the risk in relation to the assets of the company is properly insured by the company. So this is just a gist of what all is there in case of your <coughs> due diligence. Now handling vendor due diligence reports. Vendor due diligence reports, obviously, what to review? You only the VDDR, what is there in the virtual digital uh, virtual data room. Plus, is there physical documents or not? A lot of times what will happen is that, you know, and now it's decreased because of post, you know, post-COVID, uh, I've not been to a physical DD. But previously, you know, before that, a lot of companies, they were very uncomfortable with giving us virtual access to their documents. So they used to call us to their offices and they used to arrange, you know, they used to put these documents in all the rooms and tell us that, you know, sit over here, take as much time as you want. We've taken prints and put the documents here, but you review the documents here and you leave the documents here, you know, because they were not very comfortable uh, sharing it with us. Now, what happens is that if now today, like I said, that I have to do a, a top up due diligence report or I am a buyer. And I've been given a vendor due diligence report. So like I said, the buyer has uh, hired Khaitan to do diligence on his, his, his or her behalf. And the due diligence report was prepared by Amateur. Now, when I get that due diligence report, what do I see? Well, I'm trying to look at that whether that law firm has looked at everything while preparing the due diligence report. Again, these questions that I said that, you know, who, who owns the shares, who's there is the title of the property, is there any infringement claim against the IP or not? You try and look for if everything has been answered in that report. So it may be have, may have a simple line which says that, you know, there have been no claims against the company for any infringement or the company is in ownership of all the, uh, doc, uh, you know, all the IP. And we've looked at all the documents to confirm that the company owns all its IP. You would see statements like this in the vendor due diligence report. So your, uh, your work as a lawyer is to make sure that that report has, they've seen everything. And if they have not seen a certain things or you don't find certain things over there, then you see that these are the sections missing. These are the gaps which are there in the report. And these are the additional things that you would want to see. Any client questions such assumptions unanswered. Like I said, that, you know, clients may want certain things for you to focus on certain things. Like I was telling that one client asked us that, you know, we are buying it for this software. So everything in relation to this software should be there. How are they developing that software? Who are they using to develop that software? 
is it in house or have they you know taken uh, other third party consultants to help them develop that software are they using any other what are the you know soft licenses which they are using to manufacture that software to develop that software do they have proper license agreements for that etc etc now those were the questions which the client wanted us to you know figure out and when i'm reading the due diligence report the vendor due diligence report which the company's lawyer has prepared i'm not even able to find those answers over there because maybe those are things they've not looked at in so much detail so that you earmark as an area that okay maybe this is an area where we need to ask further questions and we need to get more clarity on what is happening and the similar thing is search for information gaps that you read the report you try and figure out what those people have given you as a vendor due diligence report and then this is when you're not you know doing a uh, diligence from scratch and you need to review a vendor due diligence report you try just figure out using that vendor due diligence report what all is there ask the right questions discuss with the client to determine the relevance and priority you know the idea is that you need to be sure what your client wants and what your client is looking for and again you know just uh going back to that example you would want to see that the client wants you to focus on these 10 areas and then you ask the right questions about whether or not those areas are being covered in your report that vendor due diligence report which you have or not and obviously ultimately you submit these doc questions to the other side how this generally you know it works is that the due diligence process how it works is that firstly if i am conducting a due diligence i as the legal team will send the company a due diligence requisition list which they call an information request list and irr now irl and uh, irl which is the information request list or a requisition list that has a set of questions which are there just generic set of questions that this is what the company should have this is what the company does have what are the you know who are the shareholders of the company what is the share price of the company what is the different types of shares do you have do you have any material contracts do you have any material litigations etc etc we ask them these questions basis their answers to those questions and the documents which they upload in response to those questions is how we start the diligence process and we start mapping it because it becomes easy for me to say that if i've asked them that do you have any pending litigations against you or any notices that you've received uh, pursuant to which you think that they may be for future litigation they say yes please see attached in this folder so then i just need to open that folder and see that okay these are the places where they're saying their potential litigation liabilities it helps me map the process so we do that we share that and once we've reviewed the documents we've reviewed everything we send out follow on requisition lists follow on requisition lists is now i have reviewed a document i asked them to share the contracts of the top 10 customers they've shared the top 10 customer contracts now basis that top 10 customer contracts i see one of the customer contracts has an obligation which says that whenever the company is taking any loan they should take our approval because we don't want to work with a company which has taken a lot of loans etc because it uh, they have some internal policy then you would see that you know that you will realize that the company has taken five loans over the past five years so you would ask them a follow on question that okay we note that this customer contract says that you require this customer's approval every time you take a loan and we note that you've taken five loans in the past five years please confirm if you've taken the approval of that customer for each of those loans and if yes please share us with the please share the underlying documents with us in which case they share the underlying documents with you and then you uh, just map what you've read and what you've seen so these are the follow on questions you have to ask then once everything is done the material issues need to be highlighted and housekeeping issues need to be moved to an annex chair so things which do not have you know much uh, any material threshold is not there there are small small issues which can be handled in house that's not a big deal you can buy the company and clean up all these things like imagine the leave policy of the company is not correct right you are supposed to give 15 holidays but you're just giving 13 holidays but it's not the biggest of issues which you can easily rectify once i buy the company i can you know adopt opt a new policy tomorrow and give everybody two extra holidays it's something very easy as easy as that then why go into so much detail so you don't do that and uh, that becomes a housekeeping issue managing and right use third party consultants there are a lot of things which you can't do yourself say uh, you know a lot of times when you're doing a real estate diligence you have you need local consultants in place because somebody actually has to go to that local office where the uh, property is situated to look at the registers and local records of that property so you keep your third party consultants in place sometimes you need a you know a, a, a proper charter a company secretary along with you so you hire people who as and when they are required 
dynamic work allocation you allocate work properly amongst your team make sure everybody knows who has which chapters what they need to do make sure as part of the team process in a law firm when you're working that you are you know regularly communicating with your team members because it's possible like i said that one person is looking at the uh, corporate chapter one person is looking at the material contracts and one person is looking at the finance chapter they're different people because obviously you need to finish the diligence within one week now but if this finance a person has not told the contract person who's looking at the contract documents that you know we've taken five loans in five years and then you can't put two and two together to figure out that okay in the my contract you required an approval for every loan that is taken and now because you're telling me they've taken five loans recently let me ask them if they've taken approval for those loans or not so obviously regular communication becomes important and you need to have a list of documents as a law firm why we always have a list of documents as attached to our report is that you know we do our risk allocation we tell them that we were provided with these 100 documents this is a list of those 100 documents and now this is all we've reviewed we've not seen anything more than that so we do our risk allocation basis that and regular when meaning for client updates you keep managing you know giving the client updates to everybody you make you make and tell the client up front that you know this legal due diligence board is not a legal opinion or a substitute of legal opinion i am just telling you the facts of the company as it is right so this is facts of the company as it is this is what is there this is what i have been told basis this this is what is there i am not giving you an opinion of what is there or what is not there it is not meant for third parties so please the, what we generally write as an exclusion in our diligence reports is that it is only meant for your consumption that is the client's consumption and if you want to share our report with any third party you require a prior consent for them to rely on it because we don't want that this report tomorrow becomes public everybody you know somebody comes and tells me that you know you had prepared a report on this company for your client i read that report and basis that i you know invested money in this company and now i've ended up losing money because you had not highlighted this one case which was against the company now i'm suing you that's not what i want so i want my uh, thing to very clearly state that it is only meant for my client and it is not meant for anyone else so if you are reading it you're reading it on your own accord i am not responsible for what you do out of it not a comment on summary of all the documents in relation to the target company because you can't possibly you know summarize everything of that every contract of that company you have your scope set out and basis that scope you've just reviewed everything that is there so these are just certain assumptions and certain qualifications that as a lawyer you put in your legal due diligence report so that the client tomorrow also knows that this is what you've seen this is what you've not seen this is what the report is and this is what it not is so very simple and obviously the document that containing business financial tax environmental employee diligence is separate so if you can quickly go to preparing uh, putting pen on paper how do you make the report preparatory reading do your homework read about the sector which is there read about you know what all are the implications everything on that sector which sector is it uh, you know is it an insurance sector company is it an uh, you know sports sector company is it an it ita sector company what are the laws applicable on that sector what are the latest developments happening happening in that sector is the government coming up with new laws in that sector so just know everything about it do your homework i think nothing beats that know all the laws that you are required to look at reading list what happens is that you you know it's very good thing is that if you are looking for a company sometimes you feel out of place you don't know where to start and what are licenses should that company have it's helpful that what happens is that if something some company or some competitor of that company if they've actually listed their company before listing the company you have to file what you call a red herring prospectus or a drhp you know draft red herring prospectus has to be filed in that draft red herring prospectus when a company files with the sebi you have to list out what are licenses you have what are litigations are there what are the licenses which are required to run at this particular business because you want to give all that information to the shareholders so if you are uh, your target is in the food manufacturing industry if you can if you know that there is another food manufacturing company which has recently gone for an ipo just look up their ipo offer documents to see as part of your reading list reading material to say what all licenses does that company have and then you can look for similar licenses in your target as well these are just things and hacks which help you you know easily figure out because sometimes it's easier said than done for you to google all the licenses which are there which may you may not find you know that easily so these things help 
master data and list of charges on the MCA database. Like I said, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website has all the public documents. Open that website as part of diligence. See what all documents the company has filed with the MCA. The MCA portal will tell you what are the list of charges in the company. That these the company has three directors. The master data says it has three directors. You know, it has five types of loans which the company has taken, and as a part of which it has mortgaged all its assets in the company. publicly available so unsecured loans you won't come to know uh, through the mca website but if it's a secured loan where they've created a charge on any of their assets you'll easily figure out using the mca website and obviously the targets website to see the annual reports and everything that is there scope we've already discussed that it should be 3 years or uh, you know or a top up basis on what type of report it is your substantial scope you should need to discuss regulatory issues licenses material content uh, material contracts corporate compliances finance real estate uh, intellectual property so just this is the substantive scope that you need to look for in a due diligence report so these are the things you try and look for the areas that you try and look for compliance in when you're looking for a you know during a due diligence of a company exclusions business finance tax environment so generally what we say is that you know mostly when we are doing a diligence of the company we are not commenting on if every so the prudent business decision or not should the company have done this or not all these financial and business related stuff we are not commenting on whether it's a prudent commercially or not we are just talking about the law at hand this is the law and this is how it should be done we are not here to comment on whether it's financially or fiscally prudent for you, uh, you know prudent for you to do a particular thing tax generally is you know outside our scope we leave that to specialized tax consultants or chartered accountants who are there and uh, you know we do not uh, try and interfere in that aspect so generally as part of a legal due diligence we leave out tax and we leave it to your ey then pwcs to do the tax diligence or we have a specialized tax team within khatan and other law firms also have it so we let specialist tax partners deal with it so as mna lawyers we don't get into tax that way environment again is very technical you have environmental consultants for it so we say that you know also we can look at the major licenses which you have your ctos to operate and all the major licenses but if those i cannot comment on whether or not the company is releasing any toxic material and thereby violating a law or not so you know i cannot go and verify that so i can tell you that as per the law you are not required to emit any toxic waste or you know do etc etc but i obviously cannot verify this as part of my diligence because it's way beyond my scope so you need to get your proper consultants to do that for you environmentally employment also employment generally we end up doing for the clients but yeah, in some cases where it's a highly specialized or a huge labor force a company we have specialist employment teams as well which look into this matter points to remember understand and customize the business sector of the target map and scope exclusions very important for you to understand the business of your target and ask questions based as that you know because if it's say if you buying a football uh, league you need to make sure in addition to all the else your player contracts are in place because your players are then your main commodity if you're buying a football team uh, or a cricket team you know a fran- sports franchise your players are your main commodity so make sure everything is in place for that etc etc effective reg- uh, requisition set out the priority of questions sequencing customized requisition lists concise versus detailed So these are just you know what all things you need to look at when you're making requisition lists. You should just prioritize on the important topics first. Be concise and be be specific about what you're asking so that you get exactly what you're looking for. And a lot of times it's just better to just you know pick up the phone and call the counterparty and you know explain it to them that this is what you're trying to look for. and just be concise right you know like just a example of a good requisition is to say that you know you had uploaded document 8.2.3 in the vdr page 13 the scanned copy is not clear please reupload so that anybody reads it they know exactly what you're looking for and you don't need to write a thesis saying that while we have reviewed the lease document under this we note that page 13 of the lease agreement is not clear so the idea is not to be very verbose and you know write a thesis you need to be very crisp in what you're writing and be clear about what you want just be ask concise questions what to look for we've already discussed the focus areas i think we've discussed on general corporate contracts uh 
financing we've also discussed what to look for securities any shareholder loan that the shareholders given a loan are there any intercompany loans which the company has taken regulatory we've discussed the permits which are required any change of control intimations which are required to be given to say the sebi or any other regulatory authority are there any you know intimations you require uh, because a lot of these authorities if they give you a license they uh, you know you require their approval for that for example you know somebody was uh, yesterday also we were discussing about the z and investco uh, the problem which they are having and investco wants to now drag z for that egm to replace the directors of the company now one of the things which z is saying that you know you can't just have an egm and just randomly remove the chief the ceo who's there because under the license which we have from the ministry of information and broadcasting that license says that any change in the director of the company or any change in the management of the company requires prior approval of the ministry of information and broadcasting so without that prior approval you can't change it only so it's not like you can randomly call an egm to change the director of the company so these are things which you have to look for that you know some of these licenses have these key conditionalities in there that for which you require change of control or change of uh, uh management intimations employees we've discussed compliances gratuity employment schemes etc intellectual property we discussed data protection proxies do they have a proper privacy policy or not uh in place are the licenses owned domain names do they own it or not etc real estate we've discussed the title the lease license stamp duty registration also we've discussed terms of key locations terms of agreement change in control restriction etc that's fine disputes also we discussed right now material disputes existing or threatened criminal proceedings against the management reputational claims or not description of the claim stage of proceedings so these are things you need to look for framing of the issues and ultimately you know and this we'll discuss more now in that next session which we have about how these issues generally now that you've gotten these high priority cp cs reps and warranties and indemnity specific indemnity how do you put it you know pen to paper how do these form part of our a transaction documents and uh, you know so this we'll discuss in more detail in the next thing that we're doing we've discussed what are deal breakers we've discussed what how do, what are the types of issues where we need price adjustment to take place so this we've discussed and a high importance are condition precedent like we discussed previously the low importance ones becomes condition subsequent and i am conscious about the time but we'll still keep i think i'll we'll I'll just quickly wrap this up in 5 minutes and then we'll keep 15 minutes for questions so that's fine or i think alternatively what we can do is that we i can wrap this up right now and the questions which you have in relation to this we can take up all the questions we can keep half an hour at after the session in the the next session we can give half an hour 45 minutes just for all your queries i think that will be best uh presentation it can mean excel format material issues sequencing housekeeping issues in an annexure color color coding what is happens is it becomes very uh, useful for the client is that if i color code my issues if i you know say that the red issues in red are the high priority issues issues in yellow are the medium priority and issues in green are low priority issues so for anybody who's reading my report it becomes very easy for them to figure out what are the things which are high ticket big ticket items which they need to look at and maybe some things yellow items they can leave for the time being and green is something which they can take care after they bought the company so and we've discussed you know that what is high importance becomes a condition precedent and what is low importance becomes a condition subsequent because not everything re is required to be rectified up front sometimes you can wait as well practice makes you perfect you will learn to distinguish between issues over time as in when you keep on doing diligences you will figure it out yourself what is important and what is not so important and obviously when you are starting out it's best for you to identify everything and give it to your senior or partner that you know these are all the issues that are there and with time you will be able to distinguish yourself whether or not it's you know an important issue or not materiality does it affect the proposed transaction structure you know is it something which is relation to the title of the shares or the title of the property or title of the uh, you know the ip uh you know so does it is it affecting the transaction structure is it something that they're doing a business where fdi is not allowed is that a problem does it affect the ability to purchase the securities fdi you know so see what a sector it is what is the business activity is it compliant with fdi or not 
prior consent for any license necessary for the business like we said that you know a lot of these licensing or the licenses which you have or these regulatory approvals which you have they're all based on conditions so is there any prior approval which you require in case of a change in control or not under those licenses failure to file significant delay in filing with material regulators government bodies so what is that issue so is it that the company has not made any filing with the rbi in relation to the foreign investment does it have with that it has or is it that the company is running an insurance business but it has never made the proper filings with the irda in relation to that business so you know you need to figure out a basis the sector in which the company is and what all compliances it has done housekeeping if the penalty or aggregate penalties are quantified would the amount be significant think big the deal size may be in crores right so it's a 1000 crore transaction it's a 100 crore transaction and the penalties that we would be able to find for the non compliance it at max go to 50000 or 60000 then is it a key issue no then it becomes a housekeeping issue that it's a good for you to do it because it's under the law you're required to do it but it's not a deal breaker for me right because even if you've not done it it's fine i mean it's uh, not the biggest problem delayed filing with the regulate uh, regulate uh, registrar of companies and statutory employment regulators a lot of our labor laws the penalty is very small so if you have a small thing like maintaining a wage register or a registers which you have to maintain if if you have not done it maybe the penalty is not that much so it is something which you can do as a condition subsequent once you bought the company and it's not something which is required to be done as a condition precedent without which you cannot buy the company at all so these are things poorly maintained records sometimes the company's in its internal records has not maintained it properly has not written its you know uh, minutes are not maintained properly or whatever the documents internal company documents have not been maintained properly then in that case you you know meet at a housekeeping issue the idea is that after you've done this entire diligence process and you've done everything you need to when you give it to the client you need to make sure that you are giving them a practical approach right now like we were discussing one thing is that the company undertaking multi brand retail which is not disclosed okay now multi brand retail you say again is an fdi issue or it's just doing single brand retail or whatever it is doing it's an fdi non compliant sector and you are the foreign uh, uh, company like i said one approach is to tell the client that this is a deal breaker now you can't go ahead with the deal because this one small business that they do that is fdi non compliant so you can't put in money but another approach is obviously a practical approach and a business friendly approach is say that as a cp you'll hive off the non compliant business and transfer the relevant contracts or sell it off to someone else so that the only business that is left is the fdi compliant business tell them to hive that business off demerge that particular business and send it off somewhere else so then it's not your problem the corporate registers are not maintained properly so one thing is you tell them that you know apply for compounding come at compounding is a long drawn process it will take some time another approach is highlight the risk by quantifying penalty and obtain waivers from existing shareholders for any claims slash make house in order that can be done that tell them that now start maintaining everything properly for the past non compliances take a um, you know indemnity from them for any penalty which is there while quantifying it and do a price adjustment up front so these are things you can obviously the idea is now the share certificates are not or inadequately stamped one thing is that go for adjudication that okay, the share certificates were issued 5 years ago you were not issued properly now 5 years later you're paying stamp duty on it go for a proper compounding process for adjudication or you tell your client that the practical way of doing it is that you reissue the share certificates and now when you reissuing the new share certificates pay that extra penalty for having issued the share certificates late but get them properly stamped and then issue them right now so that will save a lot of time to everybody you will get properly issued stamp duties and you won't have to go through the adjudication process which would have taken a lot of time otherwise so you as lawyers also need to sometimes come up with practical solutions rather than being going by the book because sometimes going by the book is not business friendly now that your lease deed is not properly stamped or registered again one thing is that because you, you know your lease deed is not properly stamped or registered you can either tell them to go to court now go for an adjudication process for a few months to say that we were supposed to pay stamp duty and we've not paid stamp duty we are willing to pay a fine and pay the stamp duty right now etc etc or you what you do is that you ask your client that as a condition precedent tell them to execute fresh 
uh, lease agreements with that client and get those lease agreements properly stamped and registered. Because the idea is that uh, you need the see what is the problem if the document is not properly stamped in the court of law. If a document is not stamped, it is not admissible as evidence until the stamp duty is paid. And at that time, a fine of up to 10 times the stamp duty amount can be paid. But the document in itself is not invalid. It's only not in it. It's inadmissible as evidence only until the time you don't pay the penalty and paid up the stamp duty, which is required. So in which case, what we tell them is that going forward so till now, there's not been any dispute under this contract. If going forward, you enter into fresh contract and then get that properly stamped and registered. So if there is a dispute going forward, you have a proper stamped and registered document. You don't care what happened previously because it was not your company going forward. Now you will have that proper stamp document. Now, this is what we'll discuss in our coming session about this now price adjustment specific indemnity walk away. We've already discussed possible relooking. So this is just to summarize everything possible relooking at structuring. Also, we've discussed how this goes about and modification of the terms of the transaction. So yeah, I think uh, Akshay you have. So we this is condition. And now again, this informed drafting is what we're going to discuss uh, going forward. CPs, CS, reps and warranties. How is everything done? I know we've overshot time by five minutes, but uh, okay, so I think uh, questions what we'll take is in the next round. But uh, Akshay, you can ask your question right now. Oh, good afternoon. Sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible, Akshay. Good afternoon. So, uh, in the last app, uh, where you were mentioning uh, providing practical solutions for inadequate stamping, how yeah. often is it that you run into uh, the stamp vendors? Like, how often uh, do you find yourself in a position where you require the assistance of a notary public or a vendor of stamp or a stamp licensee? And uh, do you have an in-house system for uh, solving that problem or do you have people from outside for that particular solution? We have tie ups with people who provide us, we, who help us procure stamp papers and who help us do notary. We have tie ups. Uh, we don't have in-house as of now, but we have tie ups with people who help us do that. We obviously see procurement of stamp paper. We, we procure stamp paper on a daily basis. So there are tie ups, you know, we have stamp vendors from whom we, with whom we have tie ups and we keep purchasing stamp papers on a daily basis. So the reason why I asked you this is because I am a e-stamp licensee. So is there in any way I can assist you in this regard? I'd be happy to help in this regard. Sir. Sure, sure. Uh, we can connect offline. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, okay. sir, I have a query regarding report. Too. How due diligence report is different from disclosure report, or can we use them interchangeably? No, so due diligence report is what I will conduct on you. So I am the uh, buyer. I will conduct a due diligence on your company. Correct. Disclosure letter is what your company, you as a seller will give me at the time of a transaction saying that, you know, because you are giving a lot of these reps and warranties and you're taking these laundry list of reps and warranties from me saying that my company, you know, I've not, I've been in compliance with all the laws. I've done everything, etc., etc. But these are the things which I need to disclose that. Yes, I am in compliance with all the laws, but there are these four or five small non-compliances also, which exist, which I want to disclose up front to you. So disclosure letter is what will come from the company, the seller side as part of the transaction and a due diligence is what is done by a third party or a buyer or, uh, you know, on the seller. Obviously, like we discussed, there is something called a vendor due diligence report also, but in that case also the lawyers conduct a proper due diligence on the company. Disclosure letter is just something which you disclose against the representations and warranties given in a transaction document. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so we'll take further questions after the break. If that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, we. We'll, that's what I said. We. We'll, I'll keep around half an hour, forty minutes towards the end of the session for all the questions. Right, right. So, so we'll reassemble at twelve forty, twelve forty-five. If that's fine. Oh, like, sorry, one thirty, one thirty-five. Yeah, we'll around one thirty-five ish. I think that works. Right. All right. Uh, all right. So we'll reassemble at one thirty-five. The link remains the same. So if you people want to stay logged in, that's also fine by us. And then you can rejoin. Thank you, sir. Okay.